with Brock Pierce and Young Sook Park, two leaders in the blockchain world. And, you know, Korea plays a starring role in the prehistory of all of this. Brock, uh, you came out of gaming currency, which is kind of what led to a lot of the insights that led to leadership in Bitcoin. And you had uh, gaming currency companies here. So why don't we start with you and Korea in the prehistory of all of this? Yeah, um, I was the, the world's leading market maker uh, for buying and selling uh, game currencies and, and game items. Um, and I built up that business originally in the West, so I was uh, the 800 pound gorilla in Europe and North America. Uh, but Asia clearly was a, a very big market. Korea was essentially mecca of the online games business. Uh, you know, the amount of uh, gamers playing, you know, all of the, the massively multiplayer games in Korea was unlike anywhere in the world. For most people that don't know this, the number one like most rated show, what we would think of as American Idol in the U.S. was gamers playing games. I mean, to, uh, to be a professional gamer was to be like a Michael Jordan over here. You would get seven-figure sponsorships from organizations like Nike. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. If you don't understand that about the Korean culture, it's, it's unique mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you know, it's mecca of the online games business. And so naturally, as someone that had built up those businesses in my home territories, uh, I eventually wanted to come into the Korean business, and I ended up acquiring both of the main uh, companies in Korea. The first was Item Mania, and then the second was Item Bay. Mm -hmm. And so for a decade, uh, I had over 90% market share in the game item trading business for South Korea. Uh, I, the, the, the founders stayed CEO, and I was chairman. Um, and most people don't know this well because I didn't put my face all over it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, it was best that the Korean CEOs were the faces of the company. Yeah, we didn't know. I was just the owner. <laughs> and so uh, uh, it was actually some of those same people that went on to start the Korean exchanges. I asked uh, 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 them to start what became BitThumb, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, these were all my team. Uh, wow. Young there's something about this market that is uh, mm -hmm. both an early adopter and kind of early on figures out these things, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Koreans were very early on in, in high-speed internet, very early on in gaming, and they've been leaders in blockchain. Uh, and you've been leading a lot of that initiative here. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've been working for the uh, British government 20 years and 10 years with the Australian government, married to an American for 35 years. I've been around. And Koreans uh, are very quick in adapting because this is a one nation with a one race, with a one textbook, and one word is pressed within a week, within a second, and everybody is interested in one thing, and that spreads so fast. That that is what I assume, why we are so fast in certain things. You know, it's it's interesting coming over from Silicon Valley, which we normally assume is in the leader and fast at things, but there's a culture here that that kind of understands that decentralization is exactly where things are going. And I guess because it's smaller, uh, kind of more of the population is there. And I gather it also at times creates problems. Like, isn't it the case that uh, a bunch of students were staying home and trading Bitcoin last year and the government got a little bit worried about that? That's right. Uh, even the middle school and high school <laughs> boys do not go to school but trading. <laughs> and the college students as well. So it went up like crazy and government had to track you know track them down or crash them or something <laughs> so it was uh, last year this year it's a bit down but you know Brock one of the things this points out is there are almost two personalities in crypto there's kind of the crazy maniacal gaming personality of uh, of trading and it's a game and you don't even care about the fundamentals and then there's blockchain as a fundamental source of decentralization and solving problems that traditional systems couldn't solve, but new mechanisms can. And I think like you're profoundly aware of both of those. Um, do you feel like we're at some point of transition or do both of those things continue? A and kind of how are you trying to promote the more either responsible or more societal impact side of all this? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, uh, the first use case of cryptocurrencies has been speculation you know, and trading, um, which long-term is unsustainable. No. Um, you know, it has to evolve into, you know, fundamentals uh, and actually making a positive impact on whatever it is that it's attempting to impact. 
So uh, uh, gamers were essentially the, the first wave of user adoption and primarily for speculation, I think that we're entering the second wave now, which is financial inclusion, um, where you've got you know billions of people that are on or under bank, primarily in the developing world. So Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and much in the same way that Africa skipped over wired technology and went straight to wireless, uh, I think that that's where we're, we're starting to see that. And it's all coming from the ring of fire um, it's here in the Pacific. It is kind of the Pacific century. And uh, it, it looks like it's kicking off in the Philippines more than anywhere. Coins.ph has over 5% of the population of the Philippines now using their blockchain-based wallet. Uh, the government, the central bank, um, uh, you know, the Philippines has essentially greenlit everything. I, I think that we might see 25% of the population by the end of next year. Um, using blockchain. And it's interesting because the Philippines has roughly 100 million people, 80% of whom are unbanked. And so, you know, we, we, this is going to be one of those great use cases. You know, how do we positively impact the lives of a billion people? Um, you know, the unbanked is clearly it. You know, we're democratizing the global financial system in a way where every human being on the planet is going to have equal access. And it's the least fortunate billions that are going to stand to benefit the most. And I think that we're going to see that in a big way uh, you know, starting in the Philippines. Uh, Korea is obviously leading the world right now in terms of, you know, uh, uh, market activity on a per capita basis. There's nowhere even close to, to Korea. Korea continues to be the mecca, and that is because of the gaming culture. Gamers understood that, you know, virtual currency has utility and has value, and they understood it from the gaming. Uh, it's why you're seeing adoption like we've seen in China and in Korea to the degree that we have, because these were the biggest gaming cultures. Uh, you, I mean, it, it almost perfectly maps. Where where was online gaming popular? Where did trading of online game currencies, you know, start? I mean, literally, market adoption around the world basically pairs to it almost perfectly. Yeah, this is why kind of um, a native understanding of these things gives you a native insight into where blockchain might fit. I was talking last night to a woman who's uh, starting one of the exchanges here. We were having a conversation in the middle of it. Politics came up. I had a heated politics conversation with her partner. And I turned to her, and, I sa and she's a young woman, and, and I said, I've noticed you've not brought anything up here. And she goes, well, my generation doesn't really care about politics. And I'm like, how can that be? It's the future. And where we got is she said, I care about decentralization. I care about things that work and that are fast. And then I brought up. Uh, for example, what we're doing with Switch, right, which is uh, uh, a mechanism to speed up decision making and drive money towards uh, renewables. A and I said, you know, what, 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 what you're really pointing out here is a blockchain mechanism can make decisions faster, it's decentralized, people can still make a political decision, but you don't have to wait for a government or a legislature to get something done. And she completely lit up, right, because this was connecting up her experience that traditional mechanisms are slow and we don't trust things anymore. And her other experience that these other mechanisms will be fast, but the fact that you could put the two together and solve a big social problem, it was like, well, that's the whole point of this. Yeah. But the, we're here to make the world a better place, ultimately. You know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm chain agnostic. You know, I support all the chains. Because we, 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 we're starting to see almost, uh, uh, it's almost religious fanaticism where, you know, people are saying, my religion is, I mean, my blockchain is better than your blockchain. Uh, and, and, and we need to remember we're a small, small startup industry. And most all of us are working on, you know, great things that have great potential to make the world a better place. If anyone succeeds in making the world a better place, we all win. And, uh, you know, I like to point that out uh, because a, a lot of it is becoming political, you know, uh, factions and infighting between you know, the various camps because of the amount of money involved. But, um, you know, we, we, we're supposed to be better than that. Right. We, we've for, learned from thousands yeah. of years that yeah. that mentality yeah, yeah, is not yeah. going to get us where we want to go. That's right. That's exactly. Uh, and also, it's very funny. Uh, like, um, we Koreans, I'm actually the uh, Switch Token Korea <laughs> representative. And I was the one who is pushing Switch team to come over to Korea, including uh, Peter and uh, Brad Hardin from Black and Beach and some other people, even uh, Mark Wine. Mark Weinstein, Weinberg, yeah. yeah Wein he, he, he's also, <laughs> we suggested for the first time to the Korean government, uh, first Blue House, 
and also to the Ministry of Unification, as well as uh, four different uh, representatives, National Assemblymen, for uh, introducing uh, G DMZ Solar Peace Park. <laughs> so we're going to have a, a sort of a western part of DMZ to establish a uh, switch solar park as well as a um, data center nearby so that we can utilize it. The east side of uh, DMZ is well kept. It's a well reserved. Uh, conservation is good there. Ecosystem is <laughs> very well kept. So uh, we suggested and um, most people welcomed it. We thought that government said, no, 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 it's not going to happen. But they are very positive and saying that it will happen quicker than you thought. <laughs> and I, all I this. love the idea. I love the idea. And, and what a wonderful time to be in Korea. I mean, watching the potential of sort of, you know, peace between the North and the South, unification, the idea of going and innovating in a place like the DMZ. I mean, it just, it, it's, it's like music to my ears. Uh, yeah. it's, it's exactly the sort of thing that the world needs right now. We need signs of peace, you know. We need signs of, you know, mm -hmm. unity. We need signs of, you know, progress and renewables and all of these things. And what better place to do it than, you know, at the heart of what has historically been a conflict yes. and, you know, make, make, making something beautiful happen there. Uh, anything yes. I can do to be supportive. I mean, Korea, I used to live in Pyeongchang Dong. <laughs> yeah. Really? I live next door to Pyeongchang Dong. <laughs> Songbuk Dong, I live. Okay, that's very good. So the thing is that uh, when we tried to switch, try to uh, bring renewable energy to North Korea, uh, first of all, we're going to sort of uh, send our electricity to Gaesung Industrial Complex that is built by South Korea in the North Korea so that they need <laughs> energy, of course, renewable energy. And all over North Korea, they need renewable energy. And the food, we're going to, you know, like aquaculture and some type of new te technology that we're going to bring. So that's what they need. We went to the Ministry of Unification. They want food and energy, that's all. For people watching this, it may at this point be blowing your mind that we are now talking about renewable energy and grids into North Korea and food. So a little bit of background on how this came about. First of all, it is kind of astounding that in the now just two weeks, since Trump and Kim met. Uh, in a way, this whole thing has given permission to Koreans to think about the possibility of connecting up. In a way, it allowed a story to happen where you threw out the fact that there was a war and you could accept the fact that actually you're one people and half the country needs some development. Mm -hmm. uh, so that mentality, I found, was amazing. This then led to, uh, as you pointed out, with the uh, unification ministry, the idea of what in, fa what, in fact, if there was uh, renewable production in the DMZ? Because mm -hmm. if you've got electrons coming out of the DMZ, they could go north and they could go south, mm -hmm. right? And then it also turns out there's an industrial park in the north that the north and south have been working on. And then from there, uh, well, the mine takes off. And, and, um, and all of these conversations have mm -hmm. literally happened in the last 48 hours. I'm left with the fact that... Uh, uh, in, in many ways, the, peop the people here in South Korea are reimagining what's possible and really quickly. And also, right next door, when we came up, there were a lot of people coming into the uh, elevator. Yeah. There is a seminar held right now for North Korean real estate properties to buy. <laughs> oh my God, I can't. It blows my mind up. <laughs> It's, it's it, again, what, a, what an amazing time. Yeah. Uh, what a wonderful thing to be watching happen. And, and you know, you guys are at the heart of it. Uh, what, a, what, a, what a pleasure. Uh, let's talk about two things. So, so um, we can come back. Uh, let's come back to energy in a moment. But uh, your life took quite a turn in the last year because you moved to Puerto Rico. And then the hurricane came through to Puerto Rico. And now you're kind of in the imagining reconstruction business in your island? Uh, not my island, but yes, uh, uh, in Puerto Rico. Your, your chosen new home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, right. I, I, I live there. Um, yeah. And I'm trying to make an impact. I mean, it's, it's what do you do with your life? You know, uh, what is your life's purpose? Um, you know, I want to I wanna be where I can have the biggest positive impact on the lives of others. And Puerto Rico is one of those 
just extraordinary places, and for 500 years, they've just kind of always drawn the short straw, the short stick. They've been uh, uh, just a, a long, long series of sort of unfortunate events uh, that have, you know, taken this beautiful place, these wonderful people, this incredible culture, and 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 the situation just isn't good from a debt perspective, from now an energy infrastructure perspective. You know, renewables are absolutely, you know, needed there. And hurricane season just started again. Uh, and not even everything's back online. You still had uh, roughly 10% of the population without power, about 30% of the land mass without power. Uh, at least that was the last data that I had. It's a little, it's probably a month old now. I don't know what's, probably not much has changed because it's, it's really the, it's the people that are in the center of the island. It's in the mountainous areas that are difficult to connect to. You know, the energy grid is very complicated and they really need renewable type energy sources there. Rewiring uh, you know, the mountainous areas of Puerto Rico is not the way to, 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 to get power to these people. Um, it's just, it's inefficient. It's far too expensive, and it's not fast enough. What, uh, you must have learned a lot in the now close to a year since that happened in how uh, you and a group of people who are new to the island but have investment and innovation power can collaborate with uh, everybody who's been living on the island in a way that supports them but doesn't look like yet another foreign investment coming in, right? There's a sensitivity to get that right, which uh, I know when we were together last in Puerto Rico, that was what was on the mind of the press and people talking to you. Yeah, we're, I mean, very, very focused on how to empower Puerto Rico, how to empower Puerto Ricans. Um, you know, the first thing that I'm always uh, reminding people that have decided to be part of this movement and to, to, to be of service uh, to Puerto Rico is if you haven't lived there for 10 years, find local partners, find someone that actually knows the island. You know, don't be arrogant and show up thinking that you're just going to have all the answers. Uh, what we're doing is we're helping solve the biggest fundamental problem that Puerto Rico has, which is a brain drain. Uh, Puerto Rico has had a, a huge outflow and has for a very long time of its intellectual capital, its human capital, and its financial capital. And on top of that, the college students when they've historically been graduating, haven't had opportunity. So the University of Puerto Rico Mayaguez, for example, is the number 15 engineering school in the United States. It's where NASA and Google and Facebook and Exxon and Shell come to recruit. Mm -hmm. But if you were a young dreamer, if you had a, a vision of something that you wanted to build, some innovation that you wanted to be part of, mm -hmm. you basically had to leave the island. So not only was it the, the, the adults uh, at, with their intellectual, human, and financial capital leaving, but all of the, the youth all of the potential, all of the next generation has had to leave if they wanted to, um, you know, uh, find opportunity. That's the thing that we're bringing, is we're bringing an abundance of intellectual capital, human capital, and financial capital. And these students are now going to have, there's, there's now venture capital available. If you want to start a company, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you can do that now. You know, most of us are angels, I'm angel investors, mm -hmm. you know, mentors, advisors, blockchain companies. I mean, Puerto Rico is now not just going to be a beneficiary of the innovation that's happening in the world. They're on the front line. They're gonna be some of the earliest adopters and you know, an abundance of opportunity, however they choose to participate. And that is you know, the main thing that I hope to, uh, uh, to solve is giving these college students when they graduate opportunities they've never had before. I wanna give them the tools so that they can dream and those dreams can become a reality. You know, Brock, I wrote this book with uh, Dale and with Marsha last year, The Maker City. And kind of at its core, it was about how do you bring innovation and opportunity and that stuff that goes on in big cities uh, to smaller places, right? And so in the U.S., it's about the middle of the country. That's largely the story of the last election. Uh, you know, in Europe, when you see Brexit, it's because the smaller places are trying to get opportunity. And that's really what you're describing in Puerto Rico. How does it get, how does it get the opportunity it deserves uh, from the population that's capable but hasn't yet kind of been uh, given that use? Yeah, that's exact, exactly what we're doing. And it's not just Puerto Rico that's become one of the hubs in the U.S. Wyoming is doing a great job, speaking of the center of the country. I mean, what we've seen is the, the West and East Coast yep. basically have been getting almost all of the, call it, benefit of the innovation that's been happening in the United States and everybody else is feeling deprived and without. But it's not hard uh, to, to fix that. It's just a matter of packing up your bags and going and, you know, bringing the opportunity there, educating the people. You know, it's, it's, you know, giving them opportunity. I mean, I can do what I do anywhere in the world, 
And so why not do it somewhere where it's going to have a positive impact? Um, why not go somewhere where, you know, you can positively impact the lives of lots and lots of people? I love San Francisco. I love the Bay Area. But that's not the place that needs, you know, another entrepreneur like me. Uh, you know, places like, you know, Puerto Rico, really, it, the impact is real. The, you can feel it. <laughs> it's, it's measurable, uh, you know. California's got a lot of that already. It doesn't need another another guy like me. You and I both wrote books about maker cities. It's both yes, about that. Yeah, uh, smart cities and maker cities. He's uh, he's a number one yes. in this. The legend. <laughs> yes, the legend. <laughs> the man. Yeah, he could help bring uh, your city or your Puerto Rico <laughs> marvelous ways. And I'm the co-chairman of the uh, Puerto Rico Korea <laughs> Foundation. <laughs> I'm I, I yeah, that. What, what, yeah. How amazing. Yeah, what role yeah, yeah, you yeah. are participating I know. in helping Puerto Rico. I, know. I, I love this. And we're hearing <laughs> and from another, you right now. Yeah, another <laughs> co-chairman is uh, ex-governor of Gangwon province. He's right here to meet uh, Peter <laughs> Hirschberg. But he is right into this uh, smart city as well as maker city. And he has supported by the uh, government to uh, build with um, IoT and all these high tech uh, with um, Maker City type of uh, all in infrastructure. So we can talk about that. And uh, it's uh, very good. We have, we will have <laughs> a uh, meetings or meet up from 14, 15 uh, November during the Global Leaders Forum where we're going to have all these people who want to move to or who want to visit to, who want to establish their companies to. Puerto Rico, please come, please yeah. come, and come I, to Korea. And I'm here as a resource to help any of these Korean yes, companies uh, that want to set they up. They all want to move because of you. <laughs> okay. I want to, Korea's got soul. Yeah. Korea's yeah. got soul. And if you take the E out of soul, you get to the soul. And if you take the U out, you're left with the sun. I want to wrap up and talk oh, about Switch for a little bit. Yeah. One of the things that we've learned is a blockchain solution should be applied when there's a broken game, something that doesn't work. So Satoshi saw the financial system didn't work. Turns out in the energy world, if you're trying to do energy incentives, uh, they're, they're highly local, the data is often inaccurate, it's uh, manually reported, and so what you have is a very slow-moving system for incentives. The concept behind Switch is if you could actually incent the production of renewable and then incent more, the more carbon is reduced. If you had a a system that intelligently could understand everything going on around the world, that would really both speed things up and fix a broken game, not unlike uh, going trying to fix a broken finance game. We're changing the game. That's yeah, what we're here to do. And so this is we're so moving, we're getting rid of the scarcity mentality, building an abundant mentality. You know, let's let's not just be sustainable. Let's be regenerative. You know, uh, leave, leave no trace isn't good enough. We want we need to leave things better than we find it. So I'm interested in your and DNA's investment philosophy because you guys uh, participated in Switch, and I'm wondering what you see in the kind of work that we're doing, uh, both in terms of how that's both a good investment, but also how that accelerates change, how we're using the incentive mechanism of blockchain to go accomplish what we're trying to accomplish on the globe, which maybe we couldn't accomplish in other ways. Yeah, no, I think this is exactly what the world needs right now. I mean, this is everybody needs to wake up. Everybody needs to get involved. You know, we, 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 we're living in a very, very interesting time where technology and everything is just moving at such an exponential rate that if we don't do things right, things could go very wrong. And, you know, I'm really, really happy to see extraordinary, legendary people such as yourself getting involved and trying to make a difference. I mean, that's, I'm not interested in the trading sort of mentality. I'm interested in supporting, you know, those people and those projects that are going to ultimately make the world a better place. Um, you know, I'm not coin operated. Um, I am uh, impact operated. You know, the, the, the game change that I'm focused on is, uh, uh, you know, I call the, the first game that most people play the game of compounding interest, mm -hmm. generally acting out of self-interest, trying to serve oneself. And you know, I ch I'm changing the game in terms of my individual mentality from a compounding interest mentality to a compounding impact mentality. And the metric that I'm optimizing for is positive impact. And you guys are exactly the type of project that fits square in the center of everything that I am about.
Uh, I love what you're doing. I'm glad that DNA is involved, and I want to figure out how I can be of greater service. I've, I've made a, a personal commitment to live my entire life in service, and I'm here to serve those in service first. There's been a lot of interest in Switch here in Korea. Yes, um, a lot of investors, as well as uh, those people who want to build uh, solar panels and uh, data centers, they are <laughs> all coming to us. Yeah. Very good, as well as uh, North Korean investors. <laughs> you know, we launched, in, we launched this month, and our first pilot customer is in Europe, and we already have three and a half gigawatts operating on Switch across Amazing. Austria and, and Germany. It's a lot of power. <laughs> it's a lot of power. <laughs> and uh, one of the next use cases is uh, a group called Lend Lease that builds, operates, and sells power production. So they administer the RECs and the credits, like the government incentives. Did you know these things are all like manual? You actually fill out and you attest, I made 20 uh, kilowatts, or I did it this hour. So it's, it's often like manual, can you imagine the overhead that that takes? So there's an excitement to do it on IoT, to do it trusted through blockchain, right, and then have it administered in an automated mechanism. So there's just kind of all this rampant inefficiency to work through, and then you get to the opportunity to actually drive investment to renewables where it's needed most, in the fastest growing nations where instead of diesel, now they can, burn, now they can create renewables. Yeah, and there's there, the other thing that's probably not uh, touched on very often is the, the centralized energy grids have many single points of failure. I mean, a, a, a tree falling down can knock out power grids. Um, you know, just in terms of quality of life and knowing that we have infrastructure in place that, you know, the centralized systems are, you know, too big to fail. We need decentralized systems that are more resilient so that people can have access to power, which is essential to living their lives. And that's the other interesting point. The more you get decentralized, the more you have lots of different nodes that need to be coordinated, right? Well, there is no, there is no coordination point for energy in the world. So what you need is the benefits of coordination, but in a very decentralized way, right? So well, that's really what we're talking about right. here. We're talking about decentralized intelligence that can cohere a lot of separate nodes uh, for greatest value, for greatest investment, and, and for greatest carbon reduction. Yeah, I'm, uh, yes please, more. <laughs> Well, Brock, you and DNA uh, have been big fans of and investors in what we're up to uh, with, with Switch. I'm wondering, give me a sense for your investment philosophy and the reason for your own interest. Well, again, I'm interested in projects where the team is experienced, but also trying to solve real problems and big problems, problems that uh, can have a big positive impact on people's lives. And Switch is a perfect example of that. That's why I'm a big fan of Switch. I, Love the fact that you've got such extraordinary entrepreneurs uh, 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 and leaders trying to build a community that's going to have, you know, hopefully positively impact the lives of a billion people. That's my mission. Mm -hmm. and, you, and, and, and I am here to support you in all the ways I possibly can so that you can be successful mm -hmm. in, uh, in positively impacting the lives of so many of us and, and the environment and the world around us. Thank you. I'm going to bring Switch to Puerto Rico too. <laughs> yes, that's great. We have a, we're actually. Uh, by the way, Korea's been, I've, I lived here. This was one of my homes. I mean, I, uh, between Puerto Rico and, uh, yeah. and Korea, I mean, the, yeah. This, this, I used to live here. I live in Puerto Rico now. So I'm, you know, I'm all, I always want to be in Seoul. Yeah, thank you. With and the there soul. you have it. Yeah. With the Seoul. Got Seoul. Yeah, that's right. If you want to find the future, you have to come to Korea, detour over to Puerto Rico, and from there, uh, if we can work on that, we can work on communities that can solve problems anywhere. Yes. Thank you, Brock. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Yung Suk. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Next Thank year you. in North Korea. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs>